assistant professor in the Web and Emerging Technologies Librarian here at John Jay. I started in 2020. And um, hello if I already know you, and hello if um, this is your first time interfacing with me. I'm going to hand off to Ignacio to introduce himself next. Hi, I'm Ignacio Sanchez. I'm a substitute lecturer. I'm the electronic resources librarian um, here at uh, the library. I started in September of last year, um, and I'll pass it over to Jocelyn. Hi, everyone. Jocelyn Castillo here. I am the information literacy librarian, and I started last semester as well. Uh, last week of August, actually. So uh, really excited to be here. And I really want to thank you all for joining us today. So I am going to go ahead and begin our presentation. Okay, so I decided to share this. I came across the, this data uh, from the National Center for Education Statistics, and I really found it interesting and relevant to share today. And it is because it gives us a, a sort of an overview of undergraduate student enrollment in the United States uh, in 2020 and 2021 and what is projected for 2031. Uh, so as you can see in 2021, the percentage uh, decreased by 3% uh, for a total of 15.4 million undergraduate students enrolled in the United States in post-secondary education. Uh, for 2031, as we see here, and it does take into consideration the pandemic as well, there is a projected increase of 9%, and that number seems to be estimated to jump to 16.8 million. That's what's projected. Now, to further look into those numbers, uh, I do have it here, uh, enrollment distribution by ethnicity, which is quite interesting. As you can see here, we have different racial uh, ethnic backgrounds listed here. And what I do want to point out is that from 2010 to 2021, two or more races actually increased by um, 126% from 293,700 to the number that you see listed here, which is quite interesting. Uh, Hispanic students also increased by 30% from 2.6 million to the number that you see on the screen. And Asian students increased as well by 3% uh, from 1 million to the number that you see here. So some ethnicities did see a few decreases and overall they were there were decreases, but these increases are really interesting in a sense that what's interesting about it is really the background of students that's projected to increase. That'll be interesting to see. Um, uh, which is what stands out, the diverse backgrounds of students as well. Uh, students are expected to engage, of course, in post-secondary uh, education with uh, information uh, in higher education at a different capacity. And so what that means is that some students, we can expect them to come with unfamiliarity with using certain things in a library as well as using academia for whatever, like academia research, for whatever reasons, whether it's going to be for uh, language barriers or maybe limited exposure to library resources and prior schooling, we really don't know, but we do, we are expecting an increase uh, in students, which is great. So with that said, um, the innovations that we have um, are great. We embrace and, and engage with them um, as educators to guide and succeed students, but also as well as the fundamentals to support and understand um, for supporting un uh, understanding of students' information literacy uh, perspectives is also equally valuable. And that leads me to highlighting library resources for students and faculty support as well uh, for remote learning, uh, whether it's asynchronous or synchronous. So these are some of the areas that I will be covering today. Um, we have so much information on the library homepage, so much available for faculty, for students, but I did highlight some areas here which I think are going to be fundamental areas where you can begin, especially a student that is taking classes remotely. Uh, it's going to highlight some of the things that they will need to move forward as they conduct their researches uh, for their assignments. So here, I'm gonna, of course, start off with the library homepage. The URL is there. I'm just gonna go ahead and click on it and take you there. And as you can see what I mean by, there's so much information here, right? It's like, as a student, where exactly do you go? That can also be a bit confusing if you're new to the library homepage. And I'm just gonna scroll down here to kind of show you what things look like here on the library homepage. And I'm sure most of us are really familiar with this. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, 
I'm going to go back to my presentation, tutorials. So that's going to be one section that's really going to be direct uh, for students to access online remote students. It is fundamental health for research, citations and writing. And I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. And this is what the student sees as well. So here we have some tutorials which are really helpful. So as you can see here, they will have access to research help, right? And what that entails are going to be, for example, finding books, you see that listed here, uh, finding articles, library databases, et cetera. There's a lot of information here. So one area I do want to point out is guide to finding books here. And of course, you ask yourself as an online student, well, okay, this is actually walking me through finding books physically in a library. But if you scroll down just a little bit more and students will find this helpful here, we have a section for electronic books, which is really interesting and really helps them to find materials that are, they're not tangible, but they do have access to uh, from uh, home. Uh, or again, as since these are remote students, they do have access to these books uh, quickly. Uh, here, I'm going to go ahead and go back. And on the finding articles, we have guides to finding articles. So here, as you can see, this is really nice because this gives them a little video there, which is not too long. It does walk them on how to uh, narrow down searches. When you start with searches, normally they are very broad. So this allows you to sort of bring, um, think about keywords and how to narrow down your searches so you can search in the databases. So students do have access to this page as well. So again, just general information that's going to take them to these areas where they need to find resources, right? Moving along here, just a little lower, as you can see, they can get citation help here as well. So whether it's APA style or MLA style that they're focusing on, they can actually just come in here, for example, click on APA style. If they're looking to cite an ebook, if you look here on the left hand side, click on ebooks, that's going to walk them on how to cite an ebook. Uh, which is super helpful. And again, they have access to this remotely. Uh, let me go back here. Okay, great. And I'm just going to scroll down just a little bit more. A lot of students do have uh, assignments that involve annotated bibliography or literature review, which as you can see here, this is also just a quick link to additional information. I'm going to click on the literature review. So as you can see here, they'll have information here as well on this research guide, writing a literature review. I know a lot of students and I've worked with some students last semester that were a little just confused about the differences between a research paper and a literature review. So here it does point out what the differences are, which is very, uh, which is of course going to be helpful for students that are remote and don't have access to come to the library per se rather quickly. So that's on the tutorials uh, here. Let me just go back. That was on the tutorials. So I do have a direct link to it, but if you ask yourself, okay, well, how will students access this directly from the library homepage? So from the library homepage, if you come in to help over here on the side, uh, you could click on how do I, and the tutorials do come up there. Okay, so that's, that was that first uh, tutorial that I wanted to cover. Now, research guides, we have so many research guides uh, and they are listed by subject. They are also listed by type. They are also listed by title. I highlighted these because these are going to be really important for students that are uh, asynchronous and synchronous, taking asynchronous and synchronous classes, so remote students. So how to use the library. So this really gives them a sense of what they need to know about the library. So just general information about the library from library hours, getting help from a reference librarian. So that's going to be listed here. And as you can see, you also have different tabs that students will have access to for additional information as well. And then we also have eBooks. So again, so even though I clicked on searching books under tutorials and it was a small section there, so this now is really dedicated to the eBook collection that we have, which is really great for students that are remote. So here, I'm just gonna give you an example of what they can read here. And of course, if you go into eBooks from EBSCO, they could click on this tab and they could just go directly from here as well to the database itself that's going to give them, uh, let's see here that pops up but it takes them directly to the database where they can plug in their search terms and they can find books that they can have access to uh, remotely. Okay, 
And last but not least here, streaming media. This is excellent for students, again, that are remote. Uh, so here we have a really vast collection of uh, streaming video options for students as well. I do get a lot of students that ask for Alexandra Street. I also get students that ask for Canopy. So this is one place that they could come. They could click here and they could see, of course, uh, the highlight, the, the PDFs that are available uh, here. For example, these are titles as of uh, January 17th. So that's uh, basically last week that are in their collection. So again, they do have access to this. And it's not only for students, it's also for faculty members that may have, that may find something that is relevant to what they're teaching in the classroom. So this is nice to know that we do have it all in this one particular guide. So here again, I have a direct link to it, but if you're on the library homepage and you do want to access those research guides, you could just come here to where it says research guides, right? And as I said earlier, we do have research guides listed by subject, as you can see there, by type, and we also have that option for all guides. But if you come into my type, the how to, that's going to give you access to the how to use a library research guide, as well as to the streaming video one. Now under subject, if you click on that, that is where we do have our eBooks um, research guide. So that's super helpful there. And as you can see, we have so many of them listed there, of course, by discipline as well. So that's really important uh, and interesting, of course, for students to know that we have that available there for them. Okay, so that was the research guides. Now, of course, databases. We all know we have databases by subject, by title. We subscribe to a lot of databases that students, all students have access to as students uh, at John Jay. All they have to do is, of course, log in using their credentials. But I do want to point out the popular databases that students that we recommend and that a lot of students start to use, especially if they're not too familiar with databases. So here, how do you access them? As you can see, I'm in the databases tab. But if you put your cursor right over here, this is going to give you a drop down menu of popular databases that we have readily available there for students to click on and explore. So, for example, uh, Academic Search Complete, which is a multidisciplinary database. A lot of students that are not familiar with databases will start there. But as we we all know students also like to start in Google Scholar. So what we do recommend is uh, to always allow students or to let them know that we do have it in our popular database of Google Scholar. They can come and go into Google Scholar from the library homepage, right? And I'm just going to do a quick search here, recidivism in juveniles. And actually, I'm going to continue typing. So you can see that it does give us suggestions too. That's one of the settings that we have there as far as using uh, search terms. So recidivism in um, juveniles. Uh, let me just pull it up. Great. Uh, recidivism in juveniles, as you can see here so far, my search, if I can just ask you to look at the right hand side where it says find JJ full text. So what this did is that because I came in to Google Scholar from the library, um, I'm able to see also collection materials that are in the databases in the library. They're also popping up here for me. So that gives me access as a student. You, uh, you do have they do have access to materials that are, are in the library's collection through Google Scholar, but they do have to come in through the library. Uh, so that's one thing that I like to just express to students. If not, they're just going to get pretty much commercial. And sometimes they're going to get, of course, uh, open educational resources. Um, uh, results as well. But again, to search in our collection, in the library's collection, this is a great way to search in Google Scholar. Okay, and I'm just going to go back here. And what I just want to do is, again, that was the popular databases list there. Uh, and then, of course, the by subject is going to be listed here as well. And as you can see, we do have a small box here that says multi-subject and academic search complete is there as well as Google Scholar is there. If students choose to come in by title, that's something else too. Sometimes professors have specific databases that you may want your students to go into. So, of course, they can access them by title here as well. All right, and now, oops, so sorry. And now uh, databases, now in addition to the databases, we do have uh, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, students and faculty and staff have access to uh, complimentary subscriptions to both of these uh, newspapers, which is wonderful. So here you have the New York Times. Here you have information for the Wall Street Journal. It's very easy to sign up. We also have here uh, what to do if you already have an existing 
um, subscription to them uh, and how you can make the changes to use your John Jay email, which is really what you need. So faculty members can take advantage of this. Um, students can take advantage of this as well. And I have a direct URL, but I would like to show you here again. I'm going back to the library homepage. And once I'm here, right here, it says news subscriptions, NYT and WSJ. Click on that. And that's going to take you to the information that you need to sign up for uh, the free subscriptions there. Okay, and then now virtual reference, very uh, important to know that yes, we do have uh, uh, our uh, a reference desk open to all students, but especially for remote students, we want to point out we do have chat and we also have email. So I just clicked on that I uh, on my URL, but here email us. Students can feel free to email us. This is the form they just have to fill out. We are dil diligent with this. We do follow up with students and sometimes it could become a little bit more than just an email and that all depends on what the student is looking for when it comes to a service from a or help from a librarian. We also have chat service, which is great. It is being staffed by a live librarian, not AI. Um, so that's really uh, something that remote students should really take advantage of uh, because we do have that available for them as well. So once again, I have a direct URL, but I can show you here where it says under help, ask us. Students can just come directly there, email us and chat, or even just from the library homepage. Uh, there are ways here if you scroll down, as you can see email, students have an option to do that as well. Okay, great. Last but not least, I do want to point out faculty services, right? So this, these are uh, specifically the online teaching toolbox. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. So these are some services that we have for faculty, especially those that are teaching uh, classes that are remote. So asynchronous or synchronous. Uh, we do have some uh, links here, as you can see, different information. But I do want to focus on a faculty toolbox for online teaching. So here what we do have is... Uh, we have some information here. So online library instruction, uh, if your class is synchronous, of course, it makes it, uh, you know, you could just submit the form. But if it's asynchronous too, we do have services that we can we can offer. Uh, it all depends. We will, of course, speak with the faculty member and see what, what kind of works best for the students. So we do have that available for you there. Now, what do online students have access to? Now here, I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And these are things that give you also, they have access to everything uh, in our collection as far as everything electronic in our collection. Uh, other materials and other CUNY libraries as well, as long as they have their John Jay ID. And of course, they have access to the videos and the tutorials and things I just covered, as well as access to consulting with a librarian. So these are all available, not just for students, but also for faculty members as well. Now here, just coming down to, back to the online toolkit for faculty, I just want to scroll down a little bit as we have some information there as far as embedding uh, videos into the course content. A content, excuse me, uh, linking library resources. We also have digital resources. Uh, we also have what we have this copy and paste link. So you could just directly copy and paste these links, for example, the citation guides directly into maybe Blackboard or uh, whatever, um, you know, maybe your syllabus or something like that that's online. So that those are also resources that we have. So with that said, those are all the resources I highlighted today. We do have many more, just wanted to um, have this here as well, providing online resources to students during remote learning. So we do have this for faculty members to consult as well, uh, to uh, also just kind of giving you a brief overview of things that we do offer. So we do hope that you find this information that I've shared with you today uh, helpful. And now I will pass it over to my colleague, Kate. Awesome. Thank you, Jocelyn. I'll remind you too to stop sharing so I can take over, yes. please. Um, and again, if any of you had missed that introduction, Professor Castillo is our newest information literacy librarian. Um, she started in September and we're extremely lucky to have her. So hopefully you see her face around campus and you say hi, because she's a nice lady and great job, Jocelyn. Um, so I am here to talk uh, somewhat briefly, but about the Brightspace migration. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Get rid of that. And hopefully you should all be seeing only the um, slideshow. 
Um, so this year's faculty development day theme, I want to remind everybody is um, that we are a village. So with that in mind, I recognize through my work at the library, as well as on faculty senate and on the senate this year that there are a lot of mounting anxieties surrounding the migration, the bright space LMS migration that's coming this summer. Um, so my intention for today is to remind everybody that the library is here to help. Um, although the library will not offer dedicated Brightspace training, and I do want to repeat that for emphasis, we do not have dedicated Brightspace training, um, but I do want to use today as an opportunity to assure faculty that our team is staying well informed about this big transition that's happening um, and all things related to online learning. So the Brightspace transition, it is on the horizon and the library is proactively advertising helpful faculty training training resources. Um, most of those are coming through our LMS team, which I'll acknowledge in a moment. Um, but by advertising these faculty training resources, we aim to ensure that the John Jay community stays well informed and are ready to embrace this migration ahead. Um, so let's see. Okay, um, so real quickly, I want to position the role of the library and the LMS. And to do this, I chose to evoke my predecessor, Robin Davis. Um, she was the Web and Emerging Technologies before my tenure here at John Jay. And in her article, The LMS and the Library, she poses this question, which is, what might the digital equivalent be to walking by the library on the way to class? And this point kind of, it points to the fact that the physical library is a central hub on the college campus. It's a gem on the college campus. And part of the college experience is um, is, is navigating the library. You, pa you see it in passing. It's usually um, architecturally captures you. So this photograph that I have here, this is, so when you walk into Heron Hall, what do you see first? You see this clock and behind that is the library, the reference desk, which is pretty consistent across many academic institutions. Um, but the question here is, what does this mean now that uh, the, the campus is, is kind of split or moving all the way in the direction of being on a learning management system? What does that mean for the library and the library's presence? And what it means is that the library needs to have its own real estate on on LMS, um, on LMSs, and also on Brightspace. So um, let's see. So the library aims to claim that real estate uh, on the platform. And although we don't know at this point exactly what that will look like, um, I am liaising with the LMS team. And one thing that we do know for sure that we're very excited about is um, that the library will have a dedicated um, a dedicated menu link in the main navigation bar of Brightspace. So when you log into the first page of Brightspace, um, the main navigation bar right here will have a link to John Jay's website. Um, so that's uh, an example of us taking up that real estate. So again, to point to the example of the library, the physical library, you know, you walk by, you see the library that introduces you to this idea that there's a library on campus, you go in and ask for help. This is sort of the digital equivalent of it just being present um, so that students and faculty know where to go to get library help. Um, so, Future updates regarding Brightspace and the library. Um, there are two places that I would implore you to bookmark on the library's website. Let's see, from the homepage, if you scroll down to our news blog, um, there is a blog that gives updated information about LMS training. I do wanna point out that the John Jay's college website does have a dedicated LMS transition site. So a lot of these resources are actually coming from there and coming from my discussions with Helen Kyer, who's overseeing this migration. But I think that it's important to have a place on the library's website that also points, points users in this direction. So if you go to this blog post at this point, um, it has some very simple information, including the link to Brightspace, um, the timeline for the transition, and then a link to the LMS's homepage. And then additionally, I've 
place some training materials that might help in the upcoming months as we get closer toward this migration. Um, does made an excellent presentation, which was recorded about how to declutter your courses in anticipation for the migration. So that's listed there. Um, also, Hostess Community College has some really good training materials on Brightspace. They were kind of ahead of the game. So, you know, I'm having these conversations with the LMS team. The library is having these conversations as a department. We're aware of this transition and, um, you know, we want to really just reassure everyone about um, our, our presence on campus and that, you know, the transition I think is going to go really well. Um, the other place that I have suggested for you to bookmark is actually where Jocelyn just demoed. Let's see if you go to the homepage under faculty services, there is an online teaching toolbox. At the moment, because we have not moved to Brightspace yet, there is not Brightspace um, information there. Um, but as information becomes aware or more instructions about where to look on Brightspace to find the library's uh, library information, that will be hosted at this space. So again, this is a transition that's coming up in the next couple months and will continue to, to develop and um, looking forward to the migration. Um, that is it in terms of Brightspace updates. I'm going to hand off to Ignacio. Ignacio is our substitute electronic resources librarian. This is also his first faculty development day with Jocelyn, so welcome. And uh, Ignacio is gonna talk about some AI resources, which is gonna be really fun. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, and I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Thanks, Kate. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, I'll be talking about uh, three different tools, Microsoft Copilot and Google Bard, which for the most part will be apples to apples, and then Elicit, which is for the most part a literature uh, review tool. Uh, so, But before we get started, let's talk about objectives and what we plan to uh, give you out of uh, these tools. Uh, so we'll explore the limitations uh, for generative AI, when and where to use these tools. Uh, we'll provide a few different examples for when, for how to use these tools um, and the data or where do these tools get the data basically? Is it government resources, web pages? And then it's a changing la landscape uh, for AI. So we'll, we'll talk about policies, academic integrity um, and those sort of issues. Um, and then the last point is that, like anything else, these are just uh, these are just tools. This this should not be the end of it all. So, uh, with that being said, we'll start with the first one, uh, talking about Microsoft Copilot. There are limitations to it. Um, it can only be used in the Edge browser and in the Chrome browser. Um, it's very similar if you're familiar with uh, ChatGPT. It's built on the same framework. Um, it also is very topic specific. So if you're talk talking to it, basically, like if you're talking to a person, you can only talk to it on one specific topic. You can't change topic uh, because basically you'll confuse it. And I'll show you uh, as I walk you through the example. The link uh, for, for it is right here. You're more than welcome to follow along or try it as I'm going through it. Um, I suggest that you follow along uh, because there is a registration process and it does take a little long if you do try to, uh, to register right now. Uh, so let me minimize the screen. Um, and like I said, I have, do have to switch browsers. Uh, so hopefully you can see my uh, Edge browser right now. And so uh, what I'll do is I'll use the same example for both uh, Copilot and uh, and and Bard, just to give you as an, an uh, apples to apples comparison. And a question that we would normally get from student is list a list of sources for an academic paper I'm writing on New York criminal offenders and reentry into an employment. So you just type that into uh, into Copilot, and then you'll see that it's churning basically. Um, for for basically for the for answers for you. And so you'll, you'll just give it a few minutes and it's typing for an answer. Again, it can be a little slow. And at the bottom, you'll know 
where it's pulling the information from. First, you'll see it's governmental websites, and then it'll go into EDU resources. And as it's churning the information, it's giving you, for the most part, citations, and it's also giving you the answers at the same time. So let's wait while that goes through. And again, as I said, it's very topic specific. So it's only giving you answers based on that specific topic. It does take a minute or two. You'll notice, especially when you compare this to, to BARD, that it is a little slower as well. Okay. Um, and then you'll notice that it'll give you, a, it gives you additional uh, suggestions, basically, to how to continue your search. So what are common challenges for ex-offenders? How does criminal justice system affect re-entry into society? And so it changes uh, from situation to situation. In my previous search, it actually gave me the, the term recidivism instead. So that's a common term that usually a lot of students come in and ask us for instead. And so we'll just go with that question uh, because, again, that was the, the previous example that I used. And so we'll just ask it, what is rec recidivism? Because, again, we're sticking to the same topic. Uh, that we were searching for before, and it'll define it for you. And it'll tell you where it's pulling that, that term from also at the bottom while it's thinking about it. And so it's telling you that it pulled it from uh, Webster's Dictionary, Wikipedia, and Cornell.edu. Again, keep in mind that the places that it's pulling from, it's freely av available resources. Um, none of these are... Uh, pages that would have a paywall or anything like that. And then it continues to give you additional uh, questions that you can continue to click on if you want additional information. But again, as if you're looking at it from a student perspective, you want to try to think of additional questions. So let's say you want to develop keywords. So the next question you might ask is, what term should I use to write a paper? So you type that in, and then it should give you a few different keywords uh, in the topic area, basically. And so it begins to think recidivism, as it was mentioned before. And the same way, as, a, as, as I said, it gives you freely available resources, Britannica.com, and it, it continues that way. Um, and then one other thing to think about is, are, can you get some, some data? Uh, to write these papers? And will uh, these resources give you that information? So let's think about that. Because again, it's giving you similar information from freely av available resources. Uh, we had a connection problem. So let's see what happens. To, to, let's try to reconnect. OK. Unfortunately, I have noticed that uh, with Edge, I do get the, the connection problem. If you try Chrome, it doesn't give you that connection problem, problem. It could just be a situational thing specifically here on campus, but I have noticed that before. Um, on Chrome, it's not that much of a problem, but here it has been. So um, here again, it gives you uh, where you could find information, again, specific to this topic. Um, and again, this is information that you could find easily and freely available for the most part because it's government government data. And you can continue to cite it. And so let's just wait for that to continue. Um, but if you're a student, what you want to start thinking about is, can I find papers on this specific topic? So let's see how helpful it is with, with that. So let's ask it, are there academic papers on this? And let's see what this does. Uh, ooh, we might have lost the connection. No, OK. And so it says, yes, there are academic papers on this. And like I said, this tends to be a little slower, uh, especially when we look at BARD. Um, and academia.edu, for the most part, is a freely searchable. Um, and you'll notice that it gives you that information, but it doesn't cover our other databases, for example, ProQuest, EBSCO. Um, and so it does limit the universe of the papers that that are generated through uh, through this AI tool. 
Okay, so, okay, it gives you a few. So let's say you have a good overview. And so let's say, can we get an additional additional papers on, on this topic? Make sure that you mention on this topic and you see that it gave me that option because if you don't mention on this topic, it'll be confused. Um, and so we'll give you a few more papers. on again on on this topic specifically um what i'd like to call this for the most part is a talking wikipedia because what it's doing is doing the exact same thing that wikipedia would do for you um if you're looking for this topic uh it gives you the exact same citations it gives you freely available information um it's just that it's giving you a, a bit more feedback a little a little bit more uh interaction more than anything um, but that's for the most part about it. Uh, it's limiting the universe of what you can what you can find. Um, but that's more more or less what Copilot uh, does does for for AI integration at this point. Um, so that's Copilot. Let's take a look at the next resource, and that would be that, um, Google Bard. Google Bard is a little different. Uh, Google did not go ahead and use the same language as ChatGPT. Instead, they went ahead and built their own language. Um, and so the current uh, language that they're using is Gemini. Um, it's a little different um, than, uh, than ChatGPT. Uh, Bard is compatible with most, if not all, browsers in the same manner as Copilot is very topic topic specific. So once you're talking to it on one topic, make sure that you stick with the same topic and continue from that point forward. Um, in the same way, as I mentioned with Copilot, feel free to follow along or uh, try it later. Again, it's the same process. You will have to register. So it will take a little longer if you try to uh, uh, do it uh, right now as well. Uh, so with that being said, let me go ahead and show you, whoops, uh, Bard. So you'll notice that uh, for the most part, the layout is about the same. And to compare apples to apples, we'll go ahead and use the exact same example. So we'll ask it, list sources for an academic paper I'm writing on New York criminal offenders and re-entry into employment. And so it's just thinking. And you'll notice on the left-hand side that this already remembers uh, the previous searches that I did. And so you'll notice that it is a little faster. Um, it breaks down the results for you as far as peer review journals, books and monographs, university research centers. So you could, you could see that, uh, that it classifies it for you. It, it is a little bit more organized than Google Copilot. Uh, the other part that I'll also mention is that in addition to uh, to breaking it down for you, it, it tells you that this is not the final answer, that you should also consider other, uh, other areas such as academic databases, uh, JSTOR, and Google Scholar. Uh, so for the most part, it knows its own limitations, and so it's letting you know that this is just a tool that uh, you should continue to consult other, other resources. And so again, we'll use the ex same exact uh, uh, example. What is recidivism? And what does it uh, tell us about that? Again, as I said, it is a little faster than uh, Google Copilot. Thing. And so we'll try, what term should I use to write my paper? One, one thing that you'll notice in this example is that it gives you overall themes. And one thing that it did remember is that you're talking about New York in your original question. So it did tell you specific terms related to New York. And so it does remember, again, topic specific, it does give you that relevant information. So these are terms that, um, again, if you're a student or if you're writing your research on this topic, it does remind you what it is that uh, to focus on. Um, so again, it's very topic specific and it does uh, break it down a little bit more um, in categories as opposed to Copilot. 
Uh, uh, we'll try again. Is there data available? Again, to compare apples to apples. Um, and we'll see what this does. And as I mentioned uh, previously, not only does uh, BARD mention academic resources um, and other databases, but it also uh, emphasizes the citing of data, uh, of where you get your data from. So it seems to lend itself more to the academic environment. So um, again, it's, it's, it's a little different uh, than, than Copilot. And so with that note, let's see what happens when we ask it for academic papers. Are there academic papers on this topic? It gave, it gave us a few results. And in addition to that, it gave us a few academic databases which again, we uh, started to see from the beginning. It gave us additional keywords and references as well. And again, for us, for librarians, the important part is that it mentions us to consult the librarians as well and to, and to visit the libraries. And again, the final questions that we did ask are, are there additional papers on this topic? And of course, it'll bring additional uh, academic papers on this topic as well. Um, Google Bard did not get as much fanfare as Google Copilot, um, and that's just because it came much later in the process than uh, Google Copilot. Um, but a lot of the results that Google Bard does produce uh, do seem to be more reliable from my perspective and from some of the research uh, that has been produced than Google Copilot. So this is a tool that I also recommend as well. Um, so that's Google Copilot. Uh, I'll go and demo the third tool, which is slightly different, and that is Elicit. And so Elicit is compatible with most browsers. Uh, most researchers use it for literature review. Uh, the limitation that is uh, around Elicit is that is basically around the, the results are all on the Semantic Scholar corpus. So it's basically all the papers that are within that database. Um, in the same way, feel free to follow along or try it out later. I, for this one, definitely, I would suggest to try later because this one, uh, the registration process is a lot more complicated than the other two. So let's go ahead and try Elicit. Elicit works a little different in that um, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be typing the question the same way that I that I wrote uh, wrote it in the other paper. Instead, I would be try typing in keywords basically, but I'm using the same keywords as I did in the previous two papers. So you know, New York criminal offenders and reentry into employment. And so what this is doing is it's telling you it's searching 125 million academic papers and summarizing uh, basically the papers that it found, um, which is this part right here. And then it gives you the top four papers um, and the results are basically listed here uh, with the keywords, the abstract summary in the middle section. And then it gives you additional uh, basically fields that, that you can integrate. And so, Usually what you want to know are what are the main findings for these specific papers. So you could add this very simply right here. What are the main findings for this paper? So if you want to read more about this, this paper, what is it that you want to read? In addition, usually what, uh, what you usually want to look for is who are the people that were included in these studies or in these papers. So let's say you want to know about the population sex. Uh, so it, this one doesn't mention it, but if you continue to scroll down, so this one included uh, male and female. Let's say you wanted to know uh, age, participant age. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, I'll have to minimize this. 
So this study included adolescent males or not mentioned, sorry. Um, so let's say you, yeah, you load more studies. So male six, male nine, so 18 plus. So again, you, you can continue to expand your research term and view, uh, and view additional studies basically. Um, but again, what I mentioned for, for this particular uh, tool is that it is limited to just uh, the, the, this particular universe of semantic, uh, the, the, the papers within, within uh, the semantic scholar, basically. Um, so you are limited to, to what you are searching. Uh, with that being said, what does this mean for the library? So for the library, um, again, these are only tools to inform your research. It's not the final answer. Uh, remember to consult instruct your instructor and or whatever policies govern the institution and or papers that you might be writing for. Uh, it is an evolving policy. Um, academic integrity is an important uh, uh, term to consult as well. And uh, the libraries do continue to, to follow what's happening. Our electronic resources are adapting. Scopus AI and EBSCO AI are two of the resources that are uh, launching AI. And that will hopefully be our part two to our presentation. And I'll demo what Scopus AI, or I'll show a short video of what Scopus AI is coming up with. Um, for whoops, for uh, their tool of d -d -d AI. Hold on, give me one minute. There we go. So that's what Scopus AI is looking like. Uh, EBSCO AI will be looking like similar to that, um, and we'll be having a trial run of Scopus AI in the near future. Um, and uh, we'll provide dates as to when you can sign up for that as well. So uh, thank you, and I'll pass it back to Kate. Please. Oh, I was muted. Uh, Ignacio, if you could show the last slide, please, while you're sharing. Sure. Um, which is just that we're open now for questions. If anyone has any questions about our presentation, I think I saw um, Gabrielle had something in the chat. I think it might be directed toward, oh, we have a hand up too. Ignacio, you, uh, Gabrielle is asking if you could summarize and compare the use of chat GBT, um, what would you say the use of each is? And I know you mentioned too that um, I think it's Copilot uses chat GBT logic um, and mm -hmm. data. So maybe there's not a dissimilarity there. Um, I don't know, maybe you wanna speak more. The question is in the chat. Yeah, let me let me read it um, and then, then I'll answer it. Okay, do you wanna go, um, we can, uh, Go over to Robert in the meantime while you read. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Robert. Oh, hi. Um, I have a question. Perhaps this is more for Helen Kyer. 
Uh, I often get questions from from friends, people who aren't academics and, and even academics um, about how do we ensure that students aren't using um, generative AI to write their papers. So my question to Helen is, um, does it come up in turnitin.com or the plagiarism programs if they're using generative AI to write their papers? to actually like write their papers, if they're copying and pasting from ChatGPT into their papers. Or like, I have I have my students write a paper on findings. Okay, so they pick a topic and then they find five articles. And then I want them to write a narrative where they summarize the findings from those five articles. And, you know, if, if it's not being caught on Turnitin, then I could easily see how they could just copy and paste out of the findings section on Elicit. And how would I know? So that's my question to Helen. How would I know? Not he not hearing you, Helen. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you now. Okay. Yeah. My my office computer is very flaky with with audio and Zoom for some reason. So I apologize. Um, Turnitin's base product does not check for AI generated content. The Turnitin has a um, a secondary product that available for licensing that does purport to check for AI. However, um, at the time it was released, it was returning um, an unusually high number of false positives to the point that, and again, um, this is my opinion, but in reviewing what was available from Turnitin at the time, an unacceptably high number of false positives. It was not, the product was just not ready at the time of release. Um, but that's a CUNY licensing issue also that, you know, they would have to purchase this separate product because um, it's not part of the base, a, um, base Turnitin product. It's an add-on we don't have. Okay. Yeah, right. it makes it easier for us to be duped as professors. <laughs> you know, um, students to pull a pull a fast one on us. You know, write a paper an hour before it's due and and get an A. Um, and that's not the kind of you know critical thinking and um, you know skills that we're trying to encourage. I hope. But again, it goes to what I always like to say about turn it in. Um, there's never an excuse for not reading the paper and. Um, you know, in what we've experimented here on our end with uh, AI tools, generally an educated eye can catch mistakes that the AIs just, they still make, you know, conclusions that don't follow from, from the evidence presented, um, citations that look a little fishy. Um, I'm tempted I'm sorry, to agree. I don't have a better answer. Yeah. Well, it can be very fluent in terms of the style. You can kind of start to recognize that AI style of writing. And, you know, with our typical John Jay students, you know, they're, they have, you know, typical student errors that you kind of come to recognize. I'm, I'm tempted to grade worse papers higher. <laughs> You right, know, yeah, because the, the absence between, of those errors could indicate that that student didn't write that paper. Yeah, or, you know, more problems with basic grammar could indicate the student actually did write the paper. Right. <laughs> Ignacio, do you have anything to add on that? I might add something, too. Um, I know I've noticed I pay for Grammarly's um, premium, and it's kind of funny because you could actually use AI, AI to scope out AI, and there's a feature on there that I haven't... I'm not teaching faculty, so I don't grade papers, but I have tested this feature a little bit and it will check for if for AI as well. Mm -hmm. I would imagine, you know, this is such an emerging concept that continues to almost grow leaps and bounds every day that this technology will, you know, this problem isn't going away. So this technology will continue to evolve. And also like to Helen's point, we all have our own voices as writers. I know I've like seen chat GPT answer something that I would answer completely different. So I think, yeah, I understand your point about like wanting to give a higher grade to a student who maybe has more mistakes, but is writing in their own voice. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know the answer for that, but I know, I know if I ask chat GPT something, the language that they're using 
it's not exactly how I would write. So being able to parse that, I guess, is the challenge, but possible. Well, I mean, part of the challenge from my perspective, and, and this is something I often have to remind um, instructors of, is that Turnitin re re returns a score based on how much the material in the paper matches published sources. And one of the things it doesn't do very well is sometimes is, is typographical errors on the part of a student. If, for example, they forget to use the closing quotation mark on, on a lengthy passage, turn it in, may pick that up as plagiarism when really it's a typo. It was not meant to be plagiarized. They just didn't use their quotation marks properly. I had that happen when I was teaching for public management on a paper. It looked like it was plagiarized. When really the student just didn't really, they weren't really good at APA style for citations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can never take um, that number that these these checkers return as gospel. You know, yeah, I, yeah. Um, you when I was in graduate school, what, uh, people were, students were freaking out that, oh my God, Turnitin's going to say I plagiarized. But so one of our professors ran one of her own papers through it and it matched at 40% because of how it was formatted. So you always have to read the paper and hopefully, you know, hopefully in the future, these tools will get better. Thanks a lot. Welcome, Bob. Um, I'll go ahead and answer Gabrielle's question. And okay, um, so the, to answer the comparison to ChatGPT, Copilot is written uh, based on ChatGPT. Uh, Bard is not using the same language. So like I said, Bard does function a little better than, than uh, what's it called, Copilot. Um, and then Elicit, I try to see what uh, framework they use and they were a little evasive in uh, trying to provide that information. So I'm honestly not sure. Um, and I don't think that the library has a summary page, but it's something that we sh can and should consider to provide uh, uh, for informational purposes. Um, but yeah. Were there any more questions? I maybe lost track of the chat a little bit, but feel free to raise your hand or speak up. We're right at 1214. Um, so I think if there aren't any more questions, we can conclude. Um, our emails are on this last slide here, um, which I think these slides will be made available later in February, but hopefully you remember our names and you can find us. We're here, we're on campus today. Um, so, you know, please feel free to reach out if um, you have any more questions. And one last thing before I let you all go, if you could please, please, please um, follow this bit.ly link here. I'll drop it in the chat in just a second. Or maybe Jocelyn, can you put the link in the chat while I'm fumbling? Um, yes, if you could please fill out the uh, assessment survey that we have here, that just helps inform the library um, of initiatives that you know, are wanted on campus um, and give us some feedback so that we can better assess how to, uh, you know, present at these faculty development days in the future and what to create. So if you could take, it's only three questions, like a two minutes of your time to help us out in that way, um, we really appreciate it. Now it's 1216, so I've held you over. Thank you all very much for coming. I have nothing else to add. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.